Okay. So, switching to the second lifetime zone. Good morning, and uh, it's beautiful weather out there. In Italy, it's evening, it's uh, incredibly hot. So, I am buried inside with the air conditioning working. The, tonight, we're going to talk about big data, a topic which has become very, very relevant and popular also in the media and uh, over the last months. You out to the Cambridge Analytica business and similar thing. The big data are the present and for sure are the future of our society, especially technological side, uh, advanced society and as we shall see it they are like uh, the old genus basically with the two faces, you know, the one and the bad one. It is always like that. So with the new physics was the same, you know. Physics was one of the most significant advances in our understanding of nature, but one way it opened the way for to bomb and other, you know, energy to hadron therapy and medical treatments. So everything, every time we discover something new or we have a new scientific paradigm, there are always good sides and bad sides. Um, so therefore, this talk basically will approach both aspects. First of all, the good part of the big data, which uh, is for sure going, I mean, they for sure are going to change uh, our life and they'll change it for better. And, and then at the end I will spend a few words about the dangers which are built into big data world. Let's start with a short over passes. Okay. There have been many moments in the, not too many moments actually, in the history of humankind when the human society has undergone through deep revolutions in the way of thinking, in the social structure, in the political structure. I mean, referring, I mean, we have, for instance, the sixth century when uh, mankind, the Greeks, discovered rationality with the school of most of the mystic religion began. But in more recent times, we have had a few revolutions which we can be clearly identified. One in the 16th century with the Renaissance, when we had science. Another one in the 18th century, when the Industrial Revolution, you know, our way of living has changed once forever. We have the more conceptual revolution in the 19th century, and uh, three great scientists of our age, I mean Darwin, Freud and Einstein, all three of them in different way contributed to remove the last leftover of anthropocentrism. They removed and far away from the center of the universe, let's say. I am trying to I will try to convince that what we are undergoing right now is just the, the dawn of the can call the revolution of the century. A revolution which is made out of four pieces. One end, big data. We shall extend in a few minutes what they are. Second, computer networks, the internet. Third, the artificial intelligence. And fourth, the intelligent human machine interfaces, which are often neglected, but they are a crucial piece of the puzzle. The technological evolution has been incredibly fast. The When I was born, I'm 61 now, so quite old. I, when I was born in 1957, the first satellite was launched, and it seemed a sort of miracle. 
1967, the first personal computer was invented, surprisingly enough, in Italy by Olivetti, which was the so-called Programma 101, which was the first person, uh, the first uh, portable PC. Then in 1969, humans arrived on the moon, and then the technological evolution began to speed up. In 1975, we had the first handheld programmable which was the H. Hewlett Packard 25. 1977, the founder of by phone. At the time, they were, as you can see from the picture, they were sides of a shoebox, but they did a big advancement. In 1978, the first supercomputer, A2, accessible to most. And we have the Space Shuttle in the first Macintosh. In 1992, World Wide Web, the picture you see there is the first picture which was put on web by the technicians at the CERN, the European Center for Research, where advertising a group of positions made by CERN scientists, the so-called CERNets. It was a, an alternative to the you know, also. Then in 1993, the smartphone things go up. 1997, the first social network, which was six degrees. In 1998, Google work. And then, only in 2004 and 2005, the other we had Facebook, the first modern social network after. In 2011, we had iPad and Siri, which, I mean, seems less important than the other, but as you shall see, it is not so. Now, in 2017, obviously, this exponential growth has continued, I mean, 2018, has continued, reaching levels which were almost impossible to think only a few years ago. Why? First of all, because uh, uh, our uh, the very same idea of what the CPU is has changed a lot. Now, processors equivalent of you know many my, each processor of this is much more powerful than the first Apple computer. I mean, but processors are ubiquitous. You can find them everywhere. Even recent estimates give that there is more than one processor for each human being alive on this planet, so more than 6 billion processors, hiding into your cars, into your cell phones, into your, your washing machines, into uh, any domotic topic, uh, in your PCs, and, and so on. And these processors, remember, have storage capability as well as computational capabilities. Therefore, they really are an impressive network. Connected via the internet, these processors have changed our lives. It, these billions of processors are in continuous contact among each, with each other. They share their data, they connect their information, these informations are stored in huge databases worldwide, and in this database we find all types of information, from uh, networks um, of sensor monitoring the environment, the level of pollution, monitoring seismographs, you know, the seismic activity of the earth, to monitoring the degree of humidity soil in order to optimize the crops, um, webcams all over the places, both for safety and also for monitoring, which are all over. So all these things are connected, and all these informations are moved through either dedicated or through the normal internet to form a sort of a electronic print of everything which happens around us. Yeah, as one 
as Mike said, the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is reaching a huge level of capacity. The amount of data is, uh, is unbelievable. Uh, when I began to work, the whole, the whole amount of data available on digital devices in the world was of the order of a few billions of or the order of a few hundreds of gigabytes, let's say. Or nowadays it is already to 10 to the 24th, one followed by 24 zeros of bytes, or something which is called a yotta byte, a unit which I think most of you have never heard of. And uh, in a couple, in two, three years, we expect the amount of information to grow to the level of a bronto byte, which means 1,000. Seven, seven is a huge amount of information. At the moment, the, the uh, amount of scientific data in this cloud of data is over the order 1,000, between 1,000 and 500 of the amount of data. But this fraction is bound to remain more or less constant in the future. Just to give you a comparison, I mean, the storage capability of a human brain, of a very, an eidetic human brain, like Sheldon in the big theory, let's say, it's 100 giga. So, one million or billion times smaller than the amount of data which are nowadays available on the Internet. The, all this data, at least, the largest part of them is connected via the network. And uh, the network is an incredibly complex structure. I mean, there is no way we can even grasp the complexity of the network. Not even Google is capable to produce a, a real topology of web. Uh, we estimate that nowadays there is something between 4 billion and 5 billion nodes, at least for what could in theory be uh, scanned by the normal uh, search engines like uh, Google. This you must add the dark web, which is you know at least as big as the traditional web. So basically, it's a huge amount of nodes. Each one of nodes is both source of data in the repository of data and uh, what is more important is also a source of uh, computing power therefore for the first time we have uh, a huge amount of processors connected together sharing with uh, a uh, an amount of data which is beyond any human understanding it, it, it this by itself should give you a, an idea of the which we are facing right now. The third part of the topic, as we say, is artificial intelligence. Okay, if you go on the web on and so on, you find hundreds of additional what intelligence is. But summarizing, basically, they end up to the two things which are written there. Intelligence may be seen as the ensemble of abilities which allow men to act with a purpose, to think rationally, to interact with the environment and to create a new concept. And this is one interpretation, one definition, or the capacity to analyze large amount of data, find patterns, make predictions and take decisions on the grounds of these patterns. Uh, whatever to define as artificial intelligence, the scientists, which are basically operational, have another operational definition of intelligence, which is a so-called Turing test. If you put a human being on one side of a black screen and a computer on the other side of a black screen, and you cannot see which is which, and you ask a question, you cannot tell whether the computer or human being is, a, or rather the human being, is answering to you basically as a shield of artificial intelligence. So therefore, let me show you just a few aspects of modern world. Already, machines can beat uh, 
humans in uh, in activities which until a few years ago were considered to be you know the epitome of human intelligence chess playing and uh, jeopardy the deep blue by pm won the world champion of chess the chess master of chess in uh, in an open confrontation and watson won jeopardy beating all the best human opposers so uh, as it always happens when you are dealing with artificial intelligence which seems to be the the last form of anthropocentrism we have basically we the idea that intelligence belongs only to us the they people said well but that is not intelligence you can put it under the form of an argument but then what do you think i mean about what google does every day i mean i'm sorry i didn't translate this initial sentence because i got it from an italian book but basically it's a sentence from the tonio krug by man which means lucky are the brown people wise where highs which never go that point that far away point where everything becomes difficult said which semantically speaking is equivalent uh, to not everyone can understand the complexity of life well google not only can find this sentence in all data repositories but can also find all the sentences which are semantically equivalent to this sentence so basically in other words the Google algorithms can interpret the meaning and find all the equivalent sentences all over. Google can also find all images, videos on the web which contain, for instance, the image of a chicken or the image of a vulture and good with the accuracy with the good accuracy. Or Google can also is beginning to translate every sentence every book basically in any of the 295 existing languages so this already tells you that artificial intelligence is here it's not something which will come in the near future it is already here to the point that we have cars which drive from Paris, Paris in France to China without any human intervention we have the automatic landing of planes. Most of us have landed several times under the guidance of an artificial intelligence algorithm, guidance of a pilot. What is more important in 2015, if I'm or yeah, the NASA landed Curiosity on Mars, and this was done completely controlled by the machines. There was no possibility. I mean, Mars is 14 light, um, light minutes far away, and the, land, the whole landing lasted the seven minutes. So, therefore, by the time the landing procedure started, uh, you know, uh, mission reached the Earth 14 minutes uh, after. Therefore, everything which had happened in the side of the possibility of well, the therefore. Artificial intelligence is uh, already here in specialized ways. Basically, we still don't have something as fuzzy as the human brain, which can do many different tasks with more or less the same level of lack of accuracy. But on the other hand, we have specialized algorithms which can reproduce and even uh, overcome overcome the limitations of human brain uh, safety of all this well I mean there are different aspects of the problem I won't go into the detail but I always am a little uh, uh, say surprised when I listen uh, discussions on the newspaper on the media about the privacy of communication this type of things I mean be calm about that. Each single byte of information which moves across the internet, phone calls, SMS, WhatsApp, Skype call, never moves on the internet. Even normal phone calls which go through optical fibers and this type of things, each single byte which moves on the internet 
the store, the listening station in Bluffdale, which was the only place, the first place in the world where they built a storage of one yottabyte of data with the is still largely unknown scientific community. Maybe it shall slowly leak out in 10 years. We'll under, we shall understand how they are capable to index, organize, and to extract information from one. And all this information is continuously monitored, analyzed, uh, decomposed by artificial intelligence algorithm. Therefore, the four pieces of the revolution are already all in place. Fields of application of big data everywhere. Finance, from the trend of the stock market, marketing, in the same, even the way people put items on the shelves of supermarket is decided using big data and using artificial intelligence algorithms, domotics, environment, meteorology, telemedicine, genomics, bioinformatics, as informatics, and so on, humanities, digital libraries, water supply management, whatever you can think, is in the field of action of big data and is being affected. Not by, it is therefore not a surprise that the most sought after segment of market is the so called data scientist. The growth of demand from companies, from public administration, from academies of data scientists, people capable to handle this data flow, is going an exponential growth while the number of people having this type of competencies is growing linearly. So therefore, if you have a young child, young son, some skills in mathematics, not hesitate, recommend him to put a career in this field. He will be unemployed only for a few picoseconds. I mean, very same moment they get their degree, they are enrolled, you know, by companies, by banks, by whatever. The uh, let me now move to the first part of this Jan Janus-like nature of the uh, of the big data. Uh, the scientific community was well aware of this already in the early 2000s. Uh, Microsoft sponsored uh, a, a, let's say, a book, but actually it was much more than that, sponsored a, a whole line of research, which ended up in this book, The Fourth Paradigm, which you can find on Amazon, where basically it, Jim Gray, uh, Alex Salih, and other great uh, data scientists, realize that uh, the way we do science nowadays is changed. So the two original paradigms of science, which was experimental science and theory, so basically theory intended as analytic description of the world, models, uh, you know, having physical law, were surpassed, and that uh, other two paradigms needed to added, which had different methodologies. The third one was the simulations. These were made possible by the supercomputers, and these were already present in the 60s, because they appeared like the only way to deal with the complex from phenomena, from cosmological simulation to atmospheric simulation, you know, uh, complex materials. And nowadays, I mean, 10 years ago was now, but now I will say it's well established. There was a fourth paradigm, which was data intensive science. This data intensive science, basically, it's a sort of synonym of uh, artificial intelligence, it's statistical learning, machine learning, data mining, the way you want to call it. Because the situation nowadays is that uh, most data are never inspected by humans. Already now in astronomy, in high energy physics, 
99.999% of the data are never looked, inspected, seen by human eye. Which means that most of the data analysis, most of the data compression is performed by machines through smart algorithms. What is more important, these data are far too complex to be visualized and understood by the human brain in a few slides I'll show you what. And that the world is far too complex to be understood with analytical tools. And uh, the data can only be understood, I mean, the world can only be understood through comparison of data, complex data with the simulation. So this is what e-science is all about, what we the data-driven approach to scientific discovery. To give you an idea of the potentiality, I, I just want to repeat something which I always show. If you think about it, in uh, physics, physiology, social sciences, there is not one single analytical law which depends on more than three independent variables. Take, for instance, the people we, the ideal gas law. Pressure times volume equal a constant times temperature. Three variables. One, two independent, one dependent. In the sense that if you fix pressure and volume and whatever you do, you cannot find any analytical law which depends on more than three parameters. If there is a perturbation to the law, usually it is considered as a perturbation, not as the dependence on a fourth parameter. Therefore, this leads us to a very simple question. This is a rather unrealistic simple universe. So we live in a universe where all physical laws do not depend on more than three variables, or rather all our scientific knowledge is a human bias which is introduced by the limitation of our brain. We are three-dimensional bodies who have lived and evolved in a three-dimensional world. Our learning processes, our visualization capability, our understanding capabilities suffer from this limitation. We can see patterns only in a three-dimensional space. We cannot see patterns in four dimensions, we cannot see patterns in an higher number of them. Uh, remember that when I speak about dimension, I'm not speaking only about the three spatial dimension. As many people will say, but we live in a four dimensional universe, yes. But we don't see it as a four dimensional universe, space plus time. We can understand it mathematically as a four dimensional universe, but we cannot experience the four dimension altogether not in an integral way. So, definitely, our rather simplified perception of the world, and also our rather simplified description of the world, is uh, dictated by our evolutionary limits. Machines, big data, artificial intelligence, for the first time, of, are offering us the possibility to overcome this limitation. In the astrophysical case, let me skip this slide, let me show what it means, basically. Now we have incredible machines. Uh, for instance, here you have one of the first survey telescopes in the world, uh, a beautiful telescope which is going to be sur surpassed in a few years by the largest in optical survey telescope, but this VLT telescope in Paranal, by the way, this is by the telescope which we are using to collect the data which are analyzed by that sundial collaboration which you have seen in the first slide, which I tell you about. Basically, this telescope provides you 100 gigabyte of ni per night, far too much to be inspected by these things are analyzed through automatic procedure. The final outcome of this automatic procedure is something like this. I mean, you have this is a globular cluster. Just to give you an idea of the amount of information, this is a small part of the field covered by VST with the single exposure. 
the dynamical range of a normal picture cannot reproduce the complexity. So I'm zooming in. You go to the yellow box and you see that in the yellow, in that small region, there is a huge amount of a star. Then if you go to the red box and you see below an enlargement, you see again that there is a huge amount of information. So basically, each one of these objects is either a star or a galaxy. This one are analyzed to, to automatic precision in a small part of the sky, let's say the size of a full moon, maybe in a moderate depth exposure, so not very deep exposure, you can have up to 60,000 objects. Each one of these objects is identified, its properties are measured, then these things are transformed in a string of numbers going to the details because for each object you may have a language in which to your observing the luminosity, the shape, the position. All this turns out, transforms the object which you are observing in a string of numbers. Each one of these numbers is a dimension. So at the end, you end up that your observations of the sky transform into a huge parameter space formed by billions of objects, basically the rows of a matrix, and many, many hundreds of columns, the dimensions. Each one of these columns is a parameter, therefore it can be considered a dimension. So you easily end up in parameter space which have hundreds of dimensions and billions of objects. The problem is that you need to put together all the machineries. This would have been impossible before the revolution started by communication technologies, by the computers, by the big data and so on. You need basically put together all the available technology, all the available knowledge in order to extract from these data sets a higher order standing of it. And uh, it's a complex task. Uh, this is a statement from the American National Science Foundation at uh, of this millennium, let's say, of this uh, 2002. The exploitation of massive data sets, which was the wording used before big data became very popular. At that time they were called massive data sets, now they're big Data, but these are just buzzwords, you know, the, for selling purposes. The substance is the same. Requires a much deeper understanding of computing infrastructure and of ICT technology, information and communication technologies, than what is currently done. And the requests which were put besides this uh, computing, uh, this advancement in our exploitation of big data was that the society wants to better understand the world, to exploit the technological developments deriving from it, and also the society urge, feels the urge to teach people how to put together the pieces of the puzzle and how to use for their own purposes these, these technologies. From this, you know, you have had the proliferation of projects uh, which are nowadays called crowdsourcing, citizen science, you can like them, you can dislike them, but basically it has somehow transformed also the way not only science is made, but also the way science is communicated to the world. So, and we can already know that, uh, you know, the uh, there are many discoveries which have been uh, uh, produced by this revolution. For instance, at Caltech, my colleague George Orgoski used this technology and uh, discovered the first binary quasar re or recently, actually one week ago, the exploration of this high-dimensionality parameter space allowed to discover six new phases, quantum phases of matter. And obviously, once you are dealing with this space of huge dimensionality, you want somehow also to be able to visualize the complex information which is contained in these data sets and uh, 
here I show you, I mean, there is a huge effort worldwide, you know, and uh, develop tools capable to deproject this complexity to a lower number of dimensions. The number of dimensions which can be read by the human eye, because at the end, we always want to see with our human eyes. So, here you see a few examples of this complex simulation, but what I really want to, to emphasize is that that uh, virtual communities. I mean, we are all uh, we are here in Second Life. We all know that they are fantastic gathering place. I mean, uh, offered twice by the, this new technology. This is me in the theater of the Meta Institute uh, for Computational Astrophysics, which we founded a few years ago teaching physics to undergrad that students and you know on below you see how uh, our working group meeting you know in second life because we are distributed but there is an aspect which is of second life for instance which has never been very familiar second life is also the place where for the first time people could uh, explore scientists could explore this new way to visualization here you have a few immersive data visualization realized you know by the group caltech you know and here you can see the visualization on the left you have a chemistry and biology visualization on the right side you have a visualization of a complex mathematical network and uh, uh, in, on the bottom panel, you have a visualization of all galaxies in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, characterize the, you know, their parameter. And, you know, this massive visualization of you know, virtual worlds offer us, you know, a huge amount of possibility. First of all, you can easily visualize up to six, seven parameters altogether, play shapes with the primitives. You can visualize, you know, sides, then it is more important you can navigate through the object so that you can go behind a cloud of object and see you know what is behind you know a large distribution of data points and so on but so i mean this was just for historical reason it is nice to remember that second life is much more than what we usually think i mean it's not only about socialization there is a beautiful, even though obsolete technology this, by modern standards, but it was the forerunner of many things which are happening, which will happen in the future. Let's now move for a second to the wrong side of Janus. I think that one of the most uh, interesting speech I ever heard by a president was the one which Obama gave during the Letterman show where basically Obama rightly tracked the polarization of the democracy in the United States to, to the big data. Because basically one of the wrong sides of big data is that they are not ethically neutral. I mean, actually, data are always neutral. The problem is that people who exploit this data are very seldom ne ethically neutral. So, uh, many, many things can be said about this. So, I will try to summarize as quick as I can. You know. the, every time you enter the internet, every time you buy something on the internet, every time you in, somehow interact with the search engine, what you do is a stored kept for the analysis and then you contribute at building you. your virtual identity contains more information about you than what you can do. it's not only social security number identity card the number of credit card which you have <coughs> it's much more than that it's your taste uh, sexual taste your religious taste your politics, everything and all these things can be used for all types of results. A very good, a very famous example is that if you take a fascist, leftist, a moderate, a 
you ask them to type your, on their browser, on Google, the same question, for instance, uh, Egypt, the word Egypt, the fascist gets as answer the uh, Islamic fundamentalism, the left guy gets uh, Arab, uh, Arabic Spring, I mean Primavera Araba, the Arabic Spring, the revolution in the Islamic country, and the moderate gets trip or cruise along the Nile. You are not unknown to your browser. Your browser is organized in such a way to feed you with what you like. In, um, in buying, in discussing, in politics, and social networks are exactly the same. So basically you have a loss of plurality in information and uh, you end up in living in a bubble. A bubble where basically your opinion are never subject to criticism and where your opinions get reinforced by the fact that what is offered to you by the internet is something which is expected to please you. So, if you believe that the man has never landed on the moon, you will keep, will keep getting from uh, web advertisement on uh, conspiration and theory, on sites which support your idea, and you never get another point. The, this basically is at the beginning of the radicalization of politics, of, uh, to the lack of a political debate, to the proliferation of something which has become very popular last few years in the United States, which is the so-called fake news. And therefore, basically, if you are not freaking out about the net neutrality, you are not paying attention to what's happening around. This is not only in the United States. Something similar we had it in Italy, where basically, uh, and also all over Europe, where uh, a new set of political parties, right-winged and demagogues, run by demagogues, were winning by proper exploiting network. You have the case of Cambridge Analytica, who supported Trump and made Trump win the election in the United States. But also in Italy, if you look, the Casaleggio Associati, is, which is a strategy of network, is the one which is behind the recent success of the Five Star Movement with Ayo and Salvini. So basically, if you are capable to manipulate the data, you can bring the public opinion exactly where you are. This is one aspect, terrible aspect, incredibly dangerous. And this is something which needs to be solved at uh, uh, a government level, international and local, because, I mean, it's really uh, the first time uh, we can really see democracy in danger. If I'm able to control all that amount of information, I can lead the society in the direction which I want. But there are other aspects which are even more uh, difficult. At the end, I will show a book which I strongly recommend each of you to read, which is Weapons of Matter Destruction by Katie O'Neill, a mathematician. The Look what happens on the left. Let us assume that I have a good idea, but I have no previous uh, credit record, and I want to start a small business. What happens? I go to a bank for a loan. The bank goes to this big data ocean of information, and they find that I have no previous experience. So, uh, experience. so my credit history is low. I have little financial credibility. The bank refuses the loan. My credit situation becomes much worse. I lose all hope to start my business, and I slowly drift. Why? Because the banks perform these analysis through companies, and companies are always paid by a group of interest who, do, who are aiming at reaching a specific goal. And this goal is profit. It's never public interest. Why? 
because uh, we shall see where the problem is in a few slides. Look what's happening in Europe, and but also in the United States is not much different. Research. You are a young researcher. You are very good at what you are doing, but you, for instance, work in a specialized field. The age factor, which is a way to measure uh, the effectiveness of publication, is by definition low because you work in a field where there are few scientists, so you have a few people who are citing your work. For instance, the most famous mathematician of the last century, Gold Edel, has an age factor of seven incredibly low. He published only seven papers, so his age factor you know, higher than that. And that. In nowadays world, Gadel will not got, get even a researcher position, not to mention a professor. For instance, in different fields, in astrophysics, the average age factor is 29, in astroinformatics, the age factor is 15. So I apply for a position of professor of astroinformatics. These evaluation criteria are run on common big database in a very way, I'm turn, turned down because I do not reach the average for astrophysics, even though in my field of astroinformatics I'm very, very good. And basically, instead of having an astroinformatician, I must hire someone who is a theoretical physicist or something like that. Nothing to do what I really needed. Again, this happens because governments delegate action to groups of interest who are far too limited, far too little interested in grasping the complexity of the problem and finding the proper solution. Was done to the last but one slide. Let us assume that I have a good income and I want to buy a house. I find a beautiful house which I like, I would like to buy. Then I go again to ask for a loan to a bank, but someone has classified the districts as a function of various indicators, crime rate, average income, state of maintenance. The bank refuses to give loans for house, to buy houses in those districts. What happens is that that district is penalized, loses inhabitants, loses opportunities, and slowly goes downhill transforming goes down. It's the same fiction scenario. No, it's exactly what happened ultimately what's happening in what's happening in Chicago right now. So this is basically a short overview which I, uh, I really recommend you to buy this book, this weapons of math destruction. So basically there is no to quote to paraphrase math, uh, matrix there is no blue or red pill which can save us. I mean, the only way to get out of this um, and to, to get the good part of good data and to defend ourselves against the bad part of data are knowledge and the rarest thing of all, which in my opinion is natural intelligence. Thanks to social, thanks to many, to this proliferation of hubs and this type of thing, we are losing our natural intelligence. We really should go back to direct confrontation, to debate, to discussion, but with people who think differently from us, not with people who think the same we do. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope that you have enjoyed it. I am here to answer all your questions. Thank you, I'm flattered. Uh, thank you very much. Is there any questions which I can answer? Thank you. Well, uh, Gigi, in reality, with the, some tricks, now we, uh, let's say, in a straight way, even in second life, 
you can visualize up to 11 independent parameter and this was uh, a very nice experiment made. If you have a data point which is uh, characterized by 11 parameters for instance, no, you visualize the simultaneous you can exploit a strange property of the experiment we ran many many months ago. The property is the following, I mean basically if you read it, if you look at a of a crowd, hundreds of people, you can easy, almost instantaneously recognize if in that crowd there is something you know, someone you know, because evolution has, has trained your brain to perform a special type of compression, this takes place at the routinic level, which transforms each face in a small num vector of numbers, 11, 12, 14 features. Basically, the features based on symmetry, distance of the eye, on the ratio between the distance of the eye, distance of the nose, and so on, the color of the skin, this type of things. And uh, for instance, these are also, this is also the same algorithm which is used by So what you can do basically, you can transform each point in a face, changing, you know, attributing to one parameter the color, color of the skin, another parameter the shape of the eyebrows, another parameter the roundness of the face, and this type of things. Therefore, if you do like that, with all parameters, you realize that you can almost instantaneously spot in this huge distribution of data points, uh, points which are the same. So basically you can do an operation which from a mathematical point is called clustering. So there are many, many ways to visualize more parameters. The problem is not only to visualize them, but before that, the problem is to find patterns in more information. That is much more complex, and this is the kingdom of field of data mining, machine learning, statistics, which is called the statistical learning. There you have a, a huge variety of algorithms which are currently explored, you support vector machines, uh, things like that, which can uh, to find this pattern, but in any case, yeah, uh, what you are mentioning is something which is can be done, you know, it's, it has been done actually to visualize more than three. Well, I think so, yeah, yeah, I think that next wars will be mainly in cyberspace. I mean, it depends, I mean, the, the war which really matters will be in cyberspace, because they will be, uh, I mean, let me put things like this, I mean, as long as 50% of the, I don't know what is the number, but basically that is the size of the money of the world goes into buying weapons, there will be always wars, because, you know, these companies, if there is not a war, they start it, I mean, look what's happening in the Middle East and so on, I mean, all these wars, will, like ISIS, this type of thing, will not exist in this world if companies and states were not selling them. So you will always have no type of wars, because this is what people need, you know, for selling weapons. But the real wars, those which can really uh, affect everyday life, will be found, fought in the cyberspace and question. Other questions? Thank you very much, Taglin. No, 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 no. I mean, I mean, this is a an old story. I mean, 
it's uh, it's called the solipsism. I mean, you know, Matrix has just envisioned on the screen something which has been discussing by philosophers for the last two thousand years. I mean, it's uh, what does it mean to live in a simulation? Everything which happens to us is a, an electric signal which is induced into our brain. So you know, yeah, in that sense, we all live in a simulation. Is the simulation of the world, which is uh, in our brain, uh, external stimuli. If you can control that simulation from the outside, I mean, you would end up in Matrix. I don't think, that, to tell you the truth, I don't think that something like Matrix would be impossible. In the near future, I think that will be a real option. Well, uh, that is more complex, the holographic projection of the 3D surface. Uh, yeah, there are, uh, actually things are not really like that, but the holographic universe, it's, uh, it's a sort of projection of an higher dimensionality space, yes. But that is a different story. It's not connected to what we are mentioning here. Oh yeah, it is an interesting topic, I agree with you. So if there are no other questions, I thank all of you and I move to my dinner because in Italy now it's almost, what time is it now? It's 8 o'clock, 8 in a little after eight, and I'm starving. So thank you very much, everybody, and I hope to see you soon again in Second Life. Bon appetit to you, Taglin. Thank you, Daily. Bye. Okay, this is all.